Hello, math application students, and welcome to your online lesson. Today we'll be talking about probability distributions, and we're going to learn to interpret probability distributions, and we'll know we're successful when we can use a probability distribution to interpret and answer questions about the data's probability and its mean. So the first question we might want to ask is, what is a probability distribution? Well, a probability distribution is a display of all the possible outcomes of any experiment or situation, as well as the probability of each one of those outcomes. So for example, if there were five different outcomes to an experiment, it would display the probability for each one of those five different outcomes. Therefore, the probabilities of a probability distribution, they always have to add to one. And the reason they have to add to one is because they're displaying every possible outcome as well as their probability. So all those probabilities, once again, have to add up to one because all the possibilities are going to be listed there. Every probability distribution has a random variable, and we represent that with a capital X. It's important that we notice whether it's capital or not because that capital X is going to represent a description in words. And so it's not a number, though we can set it equal to a number to create a math statement. But again, when we see that capital letter X, just know that that is almost more like a label. It is representing what we're talking about in uh, the problem. And those random variables, they can be discrete, which means they're counted or continuous, which means they're measured. So an example of a discrete random variable might be the number of students present in a class on a certain day. And again, that value can change depending on the day, um, but it's the number is a, a counted number, you know, one student present or five students present, you wouldn't have a half a student. And then continuous random variable might be something like the weight of a bolt or something like that. And again, different bolts might have different weights, but um, they're measured and they could be decimals and things like that, not counted. We're going to be focusing mostly on discrete random variables, but again, both can exist. Last thing I want to mention on this slide is the idea of the expected value of a distribution, also referred to as the mean of a distribution. It's written as E parentheses X, which we read as E of X, or the expectation of X, or you could say the expected value of X. And then just a reminder that capital X that we have there is representing a description, right? So the expected value of the number of students present in class, or the expected value of the weight of a bolt. And we find this by multiplying the value of each outcome by its probability. So if you had four different outcomes, you would take each of those outcomes and multiply it by its probability and then add up or total all those values. So you're multiplying and then adding up. And we'll see an example of that on both example two and example three on today's lesson. So a quick reminder that when we do see that capital X, it is a description. It is representing what we're talking about in words. And using this capital X to represent these words is a way to write math statements with little effort or space, much like we do when we're texting or sending a message using acronyms or other sort of shorthand uh, notation where we don't want to write everything out. We can write big statements using very little using this notation. So uh, let's go back to that example. Let's let X be uh, the number of students present in a class. And so we can make a statement like here in this first one here, where we've got that capital P, which we've seen before. So that's our probability. So the probability, and then we see that capital X there. That capital X is representing a phrase, a description. So this whole statement together would be the probability that the number of students in the class equals three. Or another way to say that, the probability that the number of students in a class is three. Or we can use a different symbol like um, this one, where we could say the probability that the number of students in a class is at least three, or greater than or equal to three. Or we could say the probability of the students in a class is in between three and seven. And again, we're saying all this um, stuff, all this information with very little writing, just using P for our probability, the big X representing the thing we're talking about in the problem, the variable, and then using numbers and uh, equations and inequalities to make that statement. And then, of course, after these statements, we can still have another equal sign where we actually put that value between 0 and 1, the probability. So again, going back to this first one here, the probability that the number of students in class is 3 
equals, let's say, 30% or 0.3 or something like that, or 70%, 0.7. So again, you can have this whole statement and then have it actually equal to a value after that. And we'll see some examples of that later in the lesson as well. So for our first example, we're not really going to be doing much math. We're just interpreting uh, the variables in this problem. It says a supermarket has three checkout stations, each with a weighing scale. The weighing scales are checked for accuracy. Let X be the random variable representing the number of accurate weighing scales. So again, think about going to a grocery store, and when you check out with produce or something like that, you might have to weigh it. And accuracy means that it works correctly. So the the random variable it states for us is the number of accurate weighing scales. That is our random variable. And we can have different numbers of random, uh, uh, different numbers of accurate weighing scales. In this uh, checkout uh, or supermarket, we have three checkout stations. So we should have three working scales, but maybe we don't have any. Maybe none of them are working. So that would be zero, would be one of the possible outcomes of our random variable. Or maybe we had just one that was working, or two, or three. All of them are working. Those are the different possible outcomes. We can't have more than three because there's not more than three scales. We can't have less than zero because that would imply all of them are not working. So the possible outcomes for this particular random variable, which is the number of accurate weighing scales, is zero, one, two, or three. No weighing scales working, one working, two working, or three working accurately. For part B, we want to write an expression using our random variable x notation that represents the probability of the following. And so the first one is one accurate weighing scale. Well, we see the word probability, so that tells us we're going to start with our capital P, and then a parenthesis, and then our big X, which again is what we're talking about here, which in this case is the number of accurate weighing scales. And we want it to be, for this first one, just one. So we'd have um, capital P parenthesis, big X equals one, or the number of accurate weighing scales is one. For double I, this time it says at least two. At least two means two or more, so we need to have uh, something that is greater than or equal to two. Again, we still are talking about probability in this problem here, so we start with our capital P, parentheses, our big X, which represents the number of accurate weighing scales in this problem, greater than or equal to two. So again, instead of having to write this whole sentence that says the probability that the number of accurate weighing scales is at least two, all we have to write is this little math uh, statement here at the bottom. All right, on to example two, where we'll actually start getting some values. So in this particular problem, we have a magazine stand, and it's recording the number of magazines bought by its customers on a specific day. 23% purchased a single magazine, 38% purchased two magazines, 21% of its customers purchased three magazines, 13% of its customers purchased four magazines, and finally 5% of the customers purchased five magazines. So the first question is to state the random variable. And so what are all these values? What is the one? What is the two? What is the three representing in this problem? And all of those are the number of magazines bought by the customers on that specific day. So that's what a random variable is. It's a description of these outcomes. So again, our random variable is the number of magazines bought by a customer. And that could be one, two, three, four, or five, as shown in this problem. Now the question might be, could we have more than this? Could we have you know, seven magazines sold? Well, hopefully that wouldn't be the case because otherwise the problem isn't really a probability distribution. And as I mentioned earlier, we should be able to check whether it's a probability distribution because all these probabilities should add up to one whole. And here we have percentages, so all these percents should add up to 100%. So if I take the probability of one magazine being sold, which was 23%, plus uh, two, which was 38%, plus three, which was 21%, plus four, which was 13%, plus five, which was 5%. And if I add those all up, I should get the whole thing, which is 100%. And now I've confirmed that this is, in fact, a probability distribution where every different outcome is represented. And zero wouldn't be part of this because if they bought zero, then they're not really a customer. They didn't buy any. Our second part of this problem, part B, says find the expected number of magazines. So expected, uh, that's again, could be representing mean. And we find that by taking each of our outcomes and multiplying it by its probability and then adding up. For example, we would take one times its probability, 0.23, I'm converting to a decimal, 
and then I would take 2 times 0.38 and 3 magazines times 0.21 and so on and so forth for all of our different outcomes and their probabilities and then we're going to add those all up and that will give us our expected value. So that's going to look like this. We write E of X, so our expected number of magazines sold or bought by a customer. And then we can see one times the probability of one magazine, two times the probability of two, so on and so forth. And then we can just throw that into a calculator. And we end up with 2.39 magazines is the expected number of magazines sold. Now, obviously, someone can't buy part of a magazine. But this is just saying that we're expecting somewhere between two and three magazines on average or a mean value of that to be sold on this particular day. For our last example, um, we have another probability distribution. And this one shows the number of cars owned by residents in a suburban neighborhood. So generally, people in the suburbs own more cars than someone who might live in the city and have more access to public transportation. The labels on this table, though, are a little bit weird. Um, let's start at the bottom here. And we've seen this notation before. We have the probability of big X equals little x. Well, what does that mean? Well, we know big X is our variable. And what's the variable that we're talking about in this particular problem? Well, in this particular problem, it's the number of cars owned by a resident in this suburban neighborhood. So the number of cars owned by a resident in a suburban neighborhood equals x. Well, what is x? Well, x are these values that we have up here. x could be 0, which means no cars, or it could be 1, where we have one car owned by that resident, or 2, or 3, so on and so forth. So um, for example, if I were to look at this first column here, Again, if I read this statement, the probability that the number of cars owned by a resident equals x, little x, and that little x would be 0 for the first column, and then I know the probability is 0 0.03, because that's the value that we have in that second column where our p is. So for part a, it says state the probability of someone in this neighborhood owning no car. Well, we actually just looked at that. That, again, would be the probability, which is given to us in this second row here. And we want the probability someone owns no car. And no car would be zero cars. That's our first column. And that probability is 0 0.03. So we can write that as a statement. P, the probability that uh, the number of cars owned is zero, is 0 0.03. That's what that whole statement is stating for us. The next question says find the value of p, little p in this case. Well, little p is right here. It's one of our probabilities. And because this is a probability distribution, we know that all of these probabilities that we have here should add up to one whole. So what we can do is we can subtract um, all the probabilities we do know from 1. So let's start with 1 and then subtract each of the probabilities. Or another way to say that is add up all the probabilities that we have and find that value and subtract from 1. Well, if we add up all these probabilities, we end up with 0 0.30 or 30%. And so that means if we subtract that from 1, the complement is 0 0.70. And so the probability of having two cars is quite large compared to the others. It's 0 0.70. So now for the very last question, it's asking us to state the expected number of cars. And again, we see that word expected. That lets us know that we are using that thing we did on the last problem, where we multiply uh, the outcome and its probability. So 0 times 0 0.03, 1 times 0.13, 2 times the 0.7, 3 times the 0 0.10, and 4 times the 0 0.04. I've got that written out for us. Again, E of X, the expected number of cars that someone in this suburban neighborhood would own. And all the work is shown there. Remember to add them all up when we're all said and done. And we end up with a value of 1.99. And the label on that would be cars. So almost two cars is the expected number. Just a little bit less than that um, is what we're expecting. And we saw that the largest probability of someone owning uh, uh, any one of these number of vehicles was two. So that makes sense again. All right, and that is going to conclude our video lesson for today. Till next time.